One of my viewers asked me in a comment that YouTube deleted because YouTube is just doing that apparently. She asked what the saddest books I had ever read were. And my knee-jerk reaction was to think on, you know, romance or sappy tear jerkers of that sort. And and my answer was I don't think I have read that many sad books, um, thinking of those genres in mind. But I wanted to make a video kind of going over what the saddest books that I had ever read. But if you know me by now, if you watched my videos, I have to stay on brand or whatever. <laughs> well, I don't have to, but I want to. You know, I, I read mostly horror and transgressive fiction. And those genres tend to be left out of the conversation for, you know, sad, emotional stories. Um, we tend to go to romances and, and dramas for that sort of thing. But um, I said, no, 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 that's not true. <laughs> um, horror is actually uh, one of the most emotionally potent genres out there, in my opinion. Um, and it can really leave you feeling utterly depressed, devastated. Uh, so, you know, some of the most memorable horror stories ever told are those that were bleak, um, emotionally powerful, uh, gripping in their sense of, you know, humanity and how well we can identify with those real human emotions. Uh, and honestly, those tend to be the stories, the horror stories that are more enjoyable to me. So I went ahead and picked out five of the saddest horror stories that I have ever read and I'm going to share that with you it, again no particular order just going by author's last name uh, and this was sort of a fun exercise to think on and you know for me to remind myself and you know let you all know that horror while we think we tend to think of it as this gimmicky sort of gross out or uh, emotionally inept exploitative mess that's usually the common perception of the genre uh, horror can actually be the source of some of the most pummeling and uh, devastating sad depressing stories and you know I think that it needs to get more acknowledgement on that regard because certainly the books that I'm going to be talking about were extremely depressing and just left just sad defeated taste in my mouth and I love them for that so um let's go ahead and get into that and of course if you have any other suggestions or uh, depressing uh horror stories that you have read please make sure to leave those in the comments and be sure to leave this video a like if you enjoy it and subscribe if you enjoy my content yada 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 let's go <laughs> The first one that I was able to pick out from my shelf was Don't Look Now by Daphne du Maurier. Daphne du Maurier is uh, perhaps most remembered. She's an English writer from the early 20th century, perhaps most remembered for her novel Rebecca and her novella The Birds, both of which were adapted into really famous and celebrated uh, films by Alfred Hitchcock. Um, but Don't Look Now was also adapted into a film uh, by uh, Nicholas Rogue. But I say that the novella, the original novella by Daphne du Maurier, definitely contains, if you're familiar with the film, definitely still contains that raw emotional power that made it so resonant and impactful. Um, and I say Daphne du Maurier has this very distinct, uh, subtle, yet gripping sense of storytelling that I really enjoy. Uh, basically, the story follows this uh, young married couple who has experienced a terrible loss. Their daughter has drowned. And so in their plight to move on with their life and uh, try to get over this emotionally devastating episode in their life, they move to Venice where a husband who is a, an architect is working on restoring uh, kind of structure um, and and while this is going on uh, a series of you know weird little happenings start to unfold uh, they meet 
uh, psychics uh, who who let them know that the husband actually possesses psychic power and he is plagued by visions of some sort, which of course they don't believe. But uh, eventually he starts having visions uh, involving his wife and a, a young figure that he thinks is his deceased daughter. And soon enough things start to unravel in a very major way until it ends in just absolute chaos and Daphne du Maurier just does not care how <laughs> devastating and impossibly depressing the the ending that she leaves you off with can be um I thought that this was incredibly depressing in so many ways you're, you're just a close intimate exploration of this dilapidated marriage and the the loss of a child you know that the the pangs the the resonance of which we we get later on in stories like uh, pet cemetery uh, etc um it's definitely a powerful sort of ahead of its time stuff i would say she was writing in the early 20th century yet her stories don't lose anything to what we could perceive as you know, outdated language or uh, depersonalized or distant settings and, and, and times. I think that du, du Maurier really does speak to that universal language of, of loss. And um, I thought it was an incredibly powerful story. Uh, and, and, and of course, if you've never seen the film version, it, it is equally engrossing and, and strange and just absolutely bleak and and stark in its detail um but yeah i really enjoy those kinds of stories that you know show you the the, the fickleness of human hope you know that that we uh can fall into this kinds of this kind of a overwhelming sense of denial and uh you know that that we cling on to hope however far-fetched it might be that place key rolls in, into the story <laughs> don't look now is certainly uh one of the most shocking tales ever told in my opinion and rightful it's recognized as such i would say rightfully so next up i'm going to talk about a novel that i actually read very recently uh come closer by sarah gran um sarah gran i had actually read her uh detective novels uh claire dewitt and the city of the dead um some years back uh, and, and I really quite enjoy her writing style. It's very sort of, she has a very sort of keen eye for detail, uh, you know, very uh, sparse with her word choice and, and definitely <laughs> feels like she's most interested in moving the plot forward. And uh, when I heard about this, this is essentially a novel about uh, ambiguous demonic possession. I heard about it without really recognizing that it was the same author because Claire DeWitt is just detective sort of suspense, not really horror. But when I read that she had written a horror novel, I absolutely had to read it. And I have to tell you, it is one of the most bleak, uh, sort of merciless stories that I have ever read. Uh, it's quite short. And I think that sort of adds to that sense of overwhelming escalation. And I think that that's kind of a staple for uh, possession uh, stories, you know, demonic possession stories. That it's all about the escalation. It's all about it's all about the subtleness and slow progression. You know, cast the seed of doubt into your mind. Is is anything paranormal really happening? Uh, I'm not really sure. And then slowly, slowly, it starts to build more and more. It's kind of a formula that was said, of course, by uh Blatty's exorcist but Sarah Grant is so masterful at it because she chooses such a, a domestic set of characters such leading such quotidian boring lives and that's kind of the crux of what she's getting at um is that it all starts with little things that you don't really don't really register as paranormal in any sense even to the end you could make the no spoilers but you could make the argument that maybe nothing paranormal really happened but the the story is i think a lot more interested in the emotional toll that that it, you know it, it's taking on the main character 
Uh, she she is married to this normal guy who doesn't like any fuss. Uh, you know, they, they have pretty, they lead a pretty wealthy, successful lifestyle. After this marriage, it's the first time that she's actually gained some sense of control and routine in her life. And then slowly that starts to unravel as she picks up with more and more uh, dangerous and uh, uh, erratic behavior. And then soon, like I said, it escalates and I'll leave it at that. But at the heart of it, what I'm getting at is that it, the, the the central piece of it is, is this marriage. Um, and, and the main character makes you guess now and then, you know, is she really happy in this marriage? Uh, is she really possessed or is she just acting out uh, her frustrations, her repressed frustrations against her husband, who in a sense could be seen as very controlling, you know, there's all this doubt that goes on. But ultimately, at the, at the heart of the story, there's a uh, professing of deep emotional love. And then you just see that honest portrayal of love become so absolutely ravaged and torn to pieces. It really took me by surprise that there's a lot in here that you sort of do not see coming or you do not see it playing out the way it does uh and i thought it was absolutely shocking and and the reason why i'm choosing it as this sad depressing tale is because sarah grant is so masterful she's so calculated and, and collected in, in the details that she's letting you know uh, and she knows exactly how to build comfort and familiarity through her characters and then when she destabilizes that it sort of grips at you in a very emotional powerful way um the way she tells the story is absolutely amazing i think she's one of the greatest writers that are still writing today uh, and this was actually if not her first novel one of her first so to see her already be such a masterful storytelling at this stage is is a sight to behold and like I said, you know, you don't really tend to think of demonic possession stories as sad or depressing. But the way it is told here, you know, when you focus on really that, that violation of a body and the violation of emotional stability through the act of demonic possession, it, it manages two things wonderfully and beautifully. One, it scares you, unsettles you. <laughs> And two, it makes you attached to the main character. And and I just have to say, Sarah Grant is absolutely merciless <laughs> with her treatment of her characters. So this was amazing. Truly, highly, highly recommended. Up next, I don't think you can talk about sadness, you know, <laughs> being emotional and sad and depressing when it comes to horror without mentioning the master himself. Stephen King. Stephen King is is a writer, was one of my, I don't really consider him my favorite writer now, but definitely from the ages of 12 to 18, I was all about him. And his stories really struck a chord with me because he has such a masterful way of portraying humanity. His narratives are very human. And I kind of talked about this in one of my earlier videos where I was comparing the, his novel, The Shining, with the film version, is that one of the biggest critiques of from Stephen King himself and fans of his novel was that uh, Stanley Kubrick adapted his book into film in a much more detached, cold, and, and impersonal way. Whereas where Stephen King really thrives is in portraying uh, the humanity and the sort of quotidian human day-to-day -day interactions between his characters what you really like about his characters is that they all have quirks that they all have emotional complexity which comes through in the narrative very masterfully he's really in touch with uh what makes people people and then of course he always throws them in harrowing uh, horrifying downright surreal you know unbelievable situations and I think um, the most devastating example of how he can really grab at that, uh, you know, part of you that, you know, is concerned with emotion, being emotionally invested in characters. The most masterful example of that to me 
is his novel Cujo. I think that this was this is one of his famous you know earlier works from his golden era of horror and, and it was adapted into a pretty famous film so I think most people are familiar with the story about a rabbit Saint Bernard who terrorizes a mother and her son who are trapped in their uh, uh, car uh, which will not turn on so they cannot escape um, and nobody knows where they are. Um, th there's that, of course, in the horror sense, there's a sense of isolation. Uh, th you know, the, the, what makes it terrifying is that there's no escape and that the monster is not um, really a monster. It's, it's a very believable, real setup, um, which is what sort of tugs at the strings of a lot of people <laughs> and makes them uneasy. But what a lot of people don't talk about when it comes to Cujo is that before any of this really starts to unravel, what you have is the story of a failing marriage and a young, vulnerable, emotional boy. You, you really become attached to him and you really become attached to the plight of this family who just cannot make, make it work. And then Cujo sort of comes in as this natural force of reckoning <laughs> that will deliver in a sense the ultimate judgment or the ultimate uh, will will uh, charge the ultimate price onto this family to me what really stands out in this novel are those passages uh where you have the husband going away on a business trip and and really sort of the conflicting emotions between his uh, lack of affection for his wife and his deep passionate love for his son and, and the wife feels, you know, in, in similar ways, you know, that she's on the one hand having an affair with another man, but on the other hand, loves her son, still loves her husband to an extent. There's still that attachment. Uh, and it's so weird that, you know, <laughs> and, and in the seemingly uh, exploitative and shocking setup of a killer rabbit, St. Bernard, <laughs> is such emotional raw power that goes largely unaddressed because of course Cujo is the star of the show <laughs> but even with Cujo you grow to have an emotional attachment Cujo to me is sort of like this modern quotidian Frankenstein you know a, a, a tragic story of of a being that is you know undergoes monstrification if that's even a word uh, against its will and against no, against its own knowledge or, or awareness. Um, I think, actually, Stephen King does a fantastic job of writing through the eyes of this dog that's undergoing this terrible uh, disease. And, and so you have these two parts that are playing beautifully, and then at the end, everything escalates to just tragedy, death, maiming, and, and this is certainly one of the most bleak and devastating works that he has ever put out. And for that reason, it's on this list. Up next, uh, I know the title of this video says horror. And that's what I'm promising you. <laughs> but, you know, horror is, is a little... These last two books that I'm going to talk about, could you could argue whether they're horror or not. I say they're horror because they contain horrific elements. That's what I'm talking about, just to be clear. <laughs> but but this novel specifically um, it gets a lot of debate over how to classify it. Is it a post-apocalyptic drama? Is it just uh, more akin to sci-fi or you know just speculative fiction in general? And you really can't be more specific than that. But when it comes to bleakness, horror, loss, depression, and sadness, I cannot make a video without mentioning The Road by Cormac McCarthy. Cormac McCarthy is, of course, I've talked about him before. I've talked about his novel, Blood Meridian, in the video I made for the most disturbing books I've read. Um, and he comes in here, this is one of his later works. And I think the one where he expresses the most emotional maturity and vulnerability, he had shown, you know, a, a penchant for writing about just depressing bleak subject matter blood meridian and child of god in all the pretty horses etc but here the the main subject matter that is explored is of course a world that's been ravaged by an unspecified 
uh, apocalyptic event that has left the entire world uh, derelict, uh, void of resources, uh, filled with human desperation for survival uh, at any cost. But, you know, the large part of it is the day-to-day -day interactions in this new world between a man and his son. And I think it's now that I real it's now that I realize that um, four out of five of the books that I picked here uh, involve these kinds of parent-child relationships being absolutely destroyed <laughs> and put to the test. Uh, maybe that speaks to my own trauma. I don't know. My psychoanalyst viewers go wild <laughs> but i think i really do think i mean Cor cormac mccarthy has said that the inspiration behind this book was his own attachment to his son in the face of uh, natural disaster and destruction and and how vulnerable he felt as a father to have such such enormous love that could so easily be devastated by any one thing and i think that's what the road does best is that it's not just the fragility of society that's at play, but the fragility of our emotions and our attachments in the face of apocalypse. You know, you see everything from like, I think one of the most harrowing moments for me was um, when the, the father finds a, a can of, of, of Coca-Cola and they share it and they have this sort of interaction uh, revolving around a thing that does not exist anymore, but that was so central to their sort of day-to-day -day interactions you know in a past world and that feeling of adaptation of of emotionally maturing for the son and of sacrifice for the dad the interactions are just so vivid palpable and they leave such a bad taste in your mouth and i think cormac mccarthy is the master of leaving a bad taste in your mouth you know, there's certain passages in here that are so disturbing just in the glimpses that you see of, you know, the, the, the societal devastation, the total regression into uh, feral behaviors, you name it. But, but I think also, you know, what's sadder beyond just this father and son trying to survive is Cormac McCarthy in very few words <laughs> paints the picture of a world that's truly come undone and you really feel that loss throughout and, and he doesn't let up on that there is not an ounce of hope and yet it never it never feels played out or tired or you know like like it's too much that you start to sort of fall out of the immersion or anything like that it's just that hopelessness and loss are at the center of the story and it's just you as a reader start to feel like you have to learn how to live with it along with the characters. And it's a really, it's a really interesting personal sort of interior experience to read this, I think, which is why I think it's made such an impact on readers for years now. Uh, and I think if you're going to talk about being depressing and bleak and harrowing, you have to talk about this book. And if you still have not read it, despite even Oprah endorsing it, <laughs> Uh, you know, don't let that fool you. This is really, really such a classic work of emotional injury and vulnerability and highly, highly recommend it. And last, but definitely not least, I am going to talk about a book that I actually just finished today. <laughs> um, this uh, book was recommended to me by my fellow booktuber. <laughs> uh, his name is Gio. And his channel is called Coding Snaps. Um, I'm going to put a link to it so you can go and subscribe to him. Uh, he's doing this really cool series where he's uh, recommending uh, horror and thriller novels uh, from outside of the United States. He's exploring like international <laughs> uh, thrillers. Uh, I think he's made two parts to that. I'm not sure if he's going to keep going with that, but if you like those kinds of recommendations, uh, he's, he also does amazing sort of uh, graphic design. He redesigned the, the book cover of The Troop by Nick Cutter to, to look like a Goosebumps book cover, which was amazing. Such a skilled guy, uh, such a nice guy, and I just have to give him a shout out because um, we both started 
doing this booktube thing around the same time uh, well i started months earlier but i i stopped posting for a while so you know we're in this journey together uh check him out uh but in in one of his videos he recommended this book and he had recommended it to me personally before and i just finished it again not sure if you would categorize this necessarily as horror more of like a mystery thriller um but i say it has enough powerful <laughs> uh, horrifying subject matter to call it a horror novel why not horror itself is a very loose label anyway so it doesn't matter this is a horror novel to me <laughs> and and quite a powerful one it, this is confessions by Kanae Minato. It basically follows the story of Yuko Moriguchi, who is this uh, middle school teacher in Japan. This is set in Japan. It's by a Japanese author um, who is giving her end of the term speech in which she is revealing that she is going to be retiring following a series of unfortunate events in her life, namely uh, the death of her daughter which was so tragic and so known in the community and you know all her students are really sad to hear about this blah 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 but then you know slowly subtly <laughs> uh harrowingly uh Yuko starts to uh let slip more and more details about her personal life namely that you know she had to call off her marriage with her daughter's father because he had tested positive for HIV and then following this um, she says that her daughter who died uh, who was found dead in the in the school uh, pool uh, she says it was not an accident even though it was ruled as such by the authority she says two of you little shits in this classroom are responsible for her death and even though the legal system does not provide any sort of punishment, I will take it upon myself to find a punishment that fits you. And then what follows is, I think, the most brutal treatment of <laughs> school and social relations that I have read in recent memory. I don't want to give too much away. And it gets crazy. <laughs> and it gets downright surreal at times. You know, the, because it jumps from... You know the, the 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 titular confessions from Yuko into you know the the, the personal accounts of of the two 13 year olds that she is accusing of having murdered her daughter into their own psychologies and defects and and just highly injured and uh, perverted relationships with parents with other friends uh you know and everybody in this, what struck me the most about this novel is that every single character seems to be undergoing such deep, unshakable pain. It's really the the quintessential sort of novel about a, a modern, urban, human suffering, and it's so absolutely gripping. And and you know the mystery that's unfolding itself in the novel is of course very intriguing, and you're reading to learn about the details and the ultimate outcome but at the heart of it of course like i mentioned before it's a, it's a tragedy and it's about the the limits of, of human connection the limits of, of human empathy and and just the the failed sort of existence that all of these characters seem to be undergoing of course revenge is a central theme throughout the novel but then we start wondering you know what is what is it about revenge that drives us is it and is it eventually gratifying or not to me this read mostly just a novel about the fallout of human communication and connection <laughs> and about what we do when we pick up the pieces of our own personal loss uh you know how we lash out how we misconstrue things how we fail to sort of get at any uh emotional well-being or peace after a certain thing has absolutely devastated us and i think can i and what minato the the author does so well is paint these highly accurate human portraits again like stephen king she's highly involved in all the personal details of her characters and um, we sort of grow attached to them in a way even if they are committing great atrocities what we can never shake off is the idea that these are humans 
and the, the story is just so plausible and real and that's really kind of what started to get at me a little bit i just felt so saddened and and the, the more several series of tragedies that are revealed here you know the more that was revealed the the worse i felt there was really nothing amounting to satisfaction or a happy conclusion and you know minato never lets up on making us feel for her characters and that connection is just amazing truly one of the best books that i've read in a while uh thank you to geo for the recommendation um and i just really felt that this needed to be included in this list as it is you know horrific uh thrilling subject matter but at the, you know at the heart of it is it's a human story about human loss and those things tend to get at me more than anything so those are my five picks uh for this video i uh, i hope you enjoyed it i hope you're interested in reading any of them or let me know if you've read any of them and what you think did they register as being sad to you you know sometimes of course depressing sad subject matter is highly subjective let me know what the most depressing or saddest horror stories are that you have read i am interested in reading more of that sort uh again thank you for watching be sure to like this video if you enjoyed it uh, be sure to subscribe if you enjoy my content, and I will definitely be putting out more videos this week, so stay tuned for that, and yeah, bye.